So this video is not scripted. Um, it's more of a discussion. So forgive me if this doesn't have any structure, but it's something I really feel like I need to address. So this is a kind of inspired by uh, Curio's video on borderline personality disorder and how it was represented or is represented in the media. But I want to talk about bipolar disorder and how it's misrepresented in the media and how that kind of fuels a lot of stigmatization around people with bipolar disorder and as an extension also schizophrenia, uh, dissociative personality disorder, dissociative personality disorder, anything that's considered one of the more scary mental illnesses, you know, with like mania and psychosis and split personalities and things that people assume are like scary traits and unpredictable and it's driving us insane. Don't worry, baby. <laughs> You'll kill him soon. Yeah, so, well, I have bipolar disorder. I have type 2, um, so that's categorized in episodes of um, severe depression and episodes of what is called hypermania, which is not full mania. It's, um, it's elevated moods or elevated energy, but it's also more what we would call mixed state. So sometimes it's not good moods or happiness at all. It's like anger and irritation and like anxiety, like really severe anxiety, which is the first kind of thing that I want to talk about, which is bipolar disorder isn't what or isn't as simple as what the media displays it as because the media you know it displays it as um like either you know the person's either always super depressed or they go bounce right up and, and are erratic and and out of control and do weird shit or like go full psychotic and it's really not as exciting and and as interesting as that like if I had to and this is a thing in psychiatry when they explain your moods to you when you get diagnosed they give you like a line and the line in the middle is like stable mood um and then they'll say you know you dip down and then you come back up and you sit at that stable mood for like days or weeks and then you might go back down and then you might come back up or in my instance I'll have an up but it's not super up but after that I'll crash but then I I won't have like depression for like a while or I like rarely have mania like I'll have it maybe like a few times a year and it's not really like like I don't <laughs> go out and buy a boat and um you know like run for president or do like all those wild kind of things it's kind of like I'll <laughs> suddenly feel the need to clean my bathroom from top to bottom like it's not as fun and exciting as how the media pins it which is part of the problem I guess I have written notes. Okay, so here's, here's just some facts. So bipolar has technically four types. And so bipolar one is um, probably the type that is represented the most in media, which is depression and mania, like full mania, total elevated moods and euphoria and, and uh, delusions of grandeur and, um, you know, like getting carried away and, and doing crazy things that's type one it's actually I mean it's it's typical it's the typical bipolar uh you know it's the one that everyone assumes when you say you have bipolar that's what they think bipolar two is what I have it's more common in women or you know afab people um people who are socialized as female and bipolar two as I said is actually more 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 depression than anything else with like hypermania here and there. Sometimes you can have psychosis, but it's very rare. And with bipolar two, you can kind of fall into a subcategory of the third type, which is a cyclic bipolar, which means you rapid cycle between moods, which I 
at times have. It's not a constant thing, but I can go from being manic or hypermanic for an hour to being depressed for like maybe a day at the most and then feel fine. And um, sometimes that cycle can continue for days or weeks. And sometimes I don't have a cycle for like ages. And then there is like a non-specified type of bipolar disorder where pers- the person um, has more mania and less depression, which is apparently the hardest to diagnose because, as I'll explain in a minute, getting diagnosed with bipolar disorder, you have to meet a certain criteria. And when you have the not typical type, it's really hard. The hardest part of managing bipolar disorder is getting diagnosed And that's because it's kind of elusive. Um, The way psychiatrists approach it is kind of an outdated criteria. Basically, they need to prove that you both have had a severe depressive episode within 12 months and a very intense manic episode within 12 months, which when you have bipolar 2, it's not that simple because you can have like true mania, but it's kind of rare and it kind of only happens if you, uh, like it's brought on by like severe stress and severe agitation. And the risk with that is you can reach a a level of mania where you go psychotic and you don't want to really trigger mania just to get diagnosed because that's just dangerous. So it, it was hard getting, my diagnosis because of the fact that I have type two, but I did have a really elevated manic episode once, which was like noticeable enough that I could bring it up. But a lot of the time when you live with a bipolar disorder and you've lived with it undiagnosed for like quite some time, your mood disturbances kind of feel the norm. And so you don't really know what to look for. Like you just think that, you know, you might have depression. And then when you come out of depression, your hypermanic episodes are maybe like perceived as being normal or being happy. So it's kind of difficult. It's not till you have something where someone's kind of like, you're acting kind of weird (laughs) that you think, wow, maybe I am acting kind of weird, which was kind of what happened with me. Again, that's like with the um, the the type of bipolar where you don't really get depression. You, if you don't have depressive episodes and just have manic episodes, you run the risk of being misdiagnosed with like uh, some kind of psychotic disorder or something. And that can go awry because you can get the wrong treatment or you can, you know, worsen your mental health. And it's a whole thing. It's really... Um, tedious. So another thing that I kind of touched on, but the uh, the getting diagnosed and recognizing mania part is that in media representation, we're always shown mania as one specific way. And that's the euphoria, the psychotic, the uh, like behaving really erratically and strangely. And it's never really addressed that especially people with type two have a mania, which is called more of a mixed state, which you have an elevated mood, but it's not happy. It's like angry and irritable and agitated and and anxious. And it's like, imagine having a, a panic attack that just kind of like sits at a level where it's like churning away inside but like you you're buzzing with electricity running through your veins and you have to move and 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 that makes you angry and it's it's such a difficult thing to explain like I always say like if when I'm hypermanic it feels like I have electricity running under the surface of my skin it feels like I'm shaking but I'm not physically shaking it's the strangest thing and that's like just the physical point like mentally I feel I feel anxious I it's almost like like when I when I'm hypermanic I kind of I clean a lot and it's to the point where like I see one one dirty part of a room that I've been cleaning and I can't calm down about it it stresses me out it makes me anxious it makes me angry it makes me angry at other people for like making that room messy and it's really irrational but that's part of hypermania and mixed mania like it's actually pretty typical and that's why a lot of people 
get misdiagnosed and a lot of psychiatrists have a really narrow viewpoint of what that is. And that's why a lot of people with bipolar type 2 specifically get misdiagnosed with borderline personality disorder, which, you know, there's a lot of similarities. And like people kind of assume that BPD is well, it's a personality-based disorder, so it affects interpersonal relationships and how you react to negative stimuli and negative social interactions and all that kind of stuff. And people kind of assume bipolar is more of a your moods, which is which it is, but like it also affects interpersonal relationships and especially how you react to um, rejection or negative criticism uh it just kind of goes the same place that bpd does where you instantly like i'm the worst what have i done wrong (laughs) and all that kind of stuff i really didn't want to go on rambling too long about what bipolar is but i i think a part of it is like recognizing the negative representation and how that skews people's image of it so before uh we start talking about representation and how a lot of bipolar representation is kind of harmful. Uh, I wanted to just chuck some facts out there for you because uh, knowledge is power, you know. Um, So the median age for getting diagnosed is generally about 25. I was diagnosed when I was 23. Um, It kind of falls into early to late 20s is that general um, range where you start to experience true Uh, symptoms. But like with that being said, adolescent bipolar is a thing. A lot of young people do develop bipolar uh, around 13 and up. And then there's also midlife bipolar where patients might not develop it until their late 30s to to mid 50s. This is the instance in my family where another family member has recently just been diagnosed and they are in their 40s. So bipolar unlike um, BPD, for example, affects all genders equally. It also has no no bias towards what ethnicity it affects. It's pretty like general across all walks of life. And it also doesn't have a social class that it really affects more drastically than other. So it's kind of different in a sense to a lot of people develop mental illness because of their social class or because of their ethnicity or because of their marginalization. Whereas bipolar kind of just happens and it can happen to anyone. So people with bipolar disorder generally like two thirds have a family member who either has clinical depression or also has bipolar depression. So there's a, like a very high chance of hereditary genetic disposition that's true for my family for example like for example bpd affects women more frequently than it affects men but it does affect men that's not to say men don't have bpd but it's more common among women same goes for bipolar 2 um it's far more common among women whereas men tend to have bipolar 1 more frequently there's probably some kind of social aspect to that i didn't really look into it a whole lot and with that women tend to be more frequently rapid cycling. They tend to have hypermanic episodes that present in agitation and irritation and anger rather than euphoria. Bipolar disorder has been shown to reduce a person's life expectancy by up to 10 years. Um, This is either a result of drug addiction, alcoholism, heart disease, diabetes, as a lot of mood stabilizers and antipsychotics lead to weight issues and metabolism issues. Um, Also, you are 15 times more likely to die by suicide. Um, 25% of suicides are made up by people with bipolar disorder. A lot of people tend to present in the first few years of their disorder kind of developing as just having depression. So a massive majority of bipolar sufferers also have ADHD. It's like somewhere between 60 to 70% have comorbid ADHD. So a lot of the times people say you either have one or the other because the depressive aspects of ADHD and like the um, the like int- the attention deficits and hyperactivity of ADHD, kind of similar to mania, but 
like more often than not, they're actually comorbid. It's not really one or the other. So in study environments, they found that only 13 to 14 percent of students who suffer from bipolar disorder actually complete degrees. And also in the workforce, you are more likely to be fired from your job or not hired if knowledge that you have bipolar disorder is apparent. Because of misconceptions, you are seen as a liability. You're not safe telling employers that you have a mental health problem, especially one of the more complicated ones. Okay, so the part of the video that I wanted to talk about. In 2015, I was hospitalized. I'd rather not say why, but in hospital, I read The Bell Jar because I am just that dramatic. I read it from cover to cover in like a week and Sylvia Plath is one of those people who are posthumously diagnosed with bipolar disorder and so I found the bell jar kind of relatable. Following that I (laughs) just to prove how dramatic I am I read Mrs. Dalloway by Virginia Woolf another woman who had bipolar disorder. I've also got Prozac Nation. (laughs) I just like reading stuff that's relatable and these writers are relatable in a way that they've lived a similar life to me. So this kind of got me on to um, An Unquiet Mind, which is a memoir written by Kay Redfield Jameson, who was actually one of the psychiatrists who revolutionized the treatment of bipolar disorder as she had it herself. This book is incredible, not only because, I mean, she's an incredible person and she really challenged how the world viewed bipolar disorder back in like the 60s and 70s and 80s with her academic career, but it gave me kind of hope as a bipolar person trying to excel in a scientific field and study that I could do it. I just needed to really work hard. These representations are what one would consider positive. They were driven, you know, they achieved great things. So why after all these years, like when was the bell jar written? Like these were like books written so long ago and it just feels like media has not progressed in any way whatsoever in like a realistic representation of bipolar disorder. The reason I kind of started thinking about this was because after watching Curio's video, I decided to rewatch Crazy Ex-Girlfriend, which is a show about a woman who has borderline personality disorder and progressively is discovering this about herself and how it affects her interpersonal relationships and how she deals with life. In this show, there's like really positive representation and it's like realistic as well. But There is a character in Crazy Ex-Girlfriend who is coded as having bipolar disorder, and that is Karen. Karen is the butt of every joke. She is a caricature. She does crazy, wacky things. No one likes her. They think she's weird. And why is Karen finger painting? I'm having a manic episode. Who wants to buy my painting? Karen, shut up! So what does that say to someone with bipolar disorder? It honestly feels like they're saying, you know, like... BPD doesn't make you crazy, but there are mental illnesses that make you crazy, you know, like it's really harmful. It really kind of changed the way I viewed the show because I always found it positive and affirming. And then I started to realize the bipolar coding in Karen and kind of started to feel like I'm still not accepted despite having this mental illness because it's one of the crazy ones. Another Example of this is Suzanne in Orange is the New Black. Uh, Sue, uh, it's short for Susie, which is short for Suzanne. <laughs> when I get angry, sometimes I can't control myself. Sometimes when I'm real upset, they tie me down like a balloon so I don't fly away. Sometimes the feelings inside me get messy like dirt. And I like to clean things. And the dirt is the feeling. Is my mind. That is called coping. I haven't watched Orange is the New Black in a really long time because I think it's kind of terrible, but Suzanne is known as Crazy Eyes, and Crazy Eyes is a thing in <laughs> armchair psychiatry which describes 
mania. Apparently, when a person is manic, they get crazy eyes. That in itself is kind of stigmatizing and you know the word crazy and associating it with a disorder that you have no choice over developing is really unfair and it's basically saying like you are slated as this crazy person now for the rest of your life the way people will perceive you is that you're weird and out of control and have no boundaries and you're crazy and insane and like you're scary to be around and that's never been a good way to view yourself. A lot of people with bipolar disorder hate themselves and are ashamed of themselves because of having that disorder. And that's directly related to how it's presented in media. Apparently in Homeland, the main character that Claire Danes plays has bipolar disorder, but I've never watched that show because I don't care for like the, the narrative of the story. Homeland security or something, I do not give a shit. But Apparently that's a positive representation. I just probably will never watch it. An example that I, I, I have always clung to and I hold very dearly to my heart is Maria Bamford. Um, she's a comedian, but you may know her from the show Lady Dynamite. Have you ever been diagnosed with any mental illness? You say diagnosis, I say diagnosis. First season was really good. I didn't really vibe with the second season, but that's okay. But Lady Dynamite basically retells the story of Maria Bamford's life uh, fictionalizes it's 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 sensationalized i guess but it's kind of true and Karen Grisham was right i do feel better now that i'm off my meds i feel super charged <laughs> i'm not even thinking about Graham. i'm pushing on my feelings thanks to you guys i don't need drugs cuz i I didn't really want to touch on movies because movies can have really good representation because a director has control over how the characters represented, resent, represented. But then there are movies where it's told from the perspective of, say, a child or a friend of someone who has bipolar disorder. And it's kind of using that person as a plot device rather than being like, this is a real person and what they struggle through is something I can never comprehend because it's incredibly difficult to live with something like this. It's always kind of like, oh, this person's kind of wild and wacky and they make my life hard and I don't like it. And it's it's very unsympathetic. One of the more funny examples is, okay, so you know that theory with um Winnie the Pooh, how all the toys represent aspects of Christopher Robin's personality and how there's like this assumption that Christopher Robin must have bipolar disorder because you have Eeyore, which is like obviously major depression. And then you have Tigger, which is like full mania. <sighs> it's like that kind of thing where someone who's like read the DSM once and they're kind of like, yeah, well, that's clearly bipolar disorder. So the thing with bipolar characters and bipolar stories is that they're always a joke or they're always scary. People view bipolar disorder and schizophrenia as being dangerous. It's like there's so many statistics that prove that people with these illnesses are more likely to be abused and to be mistreated rather than do the abusing and mistreatment. People view illnesses like anxiety and depression with a much more sympathetic gaze because it's relatable, because Anyone can get depressed and anyone can have anxiety, but things that they can't picture themselves living with suddenly feel extreme and uncharted territory and thus must be dangerous because people are xenophobic in nature. What they don't understand is something to fear. People with bipolar disorder and schizophrenia and dissociative... Di I, oh fuck, I can never get that right. Dissociative... <laughs> dissociative identity disorder are never presented well they can be but rarely are presented in media as just being just like every other person with a unique struggle that's maybe different and maybe slightly less common the more we view people with bipolar disorder as being this caricature of the man who who snaps and, and shoots up a place I don't know for I don't can't think of 
I'm sure there's been a shooter in recent history that's had bipolar disorder and people have fucking run with it, just the same as schizophrenia. It makes you hate yourself, but it also makes other people think you're dangerous. I've never once lived an instance where I've been manic or hypermanic or even psychotic and felt like I've endangered people. I had people feel like I've endangered them. And that's something that needs to be communicated. And the same for schizophrenia, especially. That's one that still is taboo and highly stigmatized and highly misrepresented in media. I wish I could talk more about that, but I would rather leave it to someone who has schizophrenia to talk about it. It's not my struggle to discuss. Bipolar is usually always represented in media as manic and disorganized thinking and chaotic mood swings and behaving erratically. That kind of seeps in and out of psychiatry. That is one of the misconceptions that makes it so hard to get diagnosed, to get treated, to secure stable living, working, studying situations. I mean, it's harmful. When I do see these representations, it does hurt like a lot. And not only does it hurt me, but I mistrust people with how they see that because they're taking in that information and processing it subconsciously. And I don't know, it puts my safety at risk to some degree. I know this hasn't been a very fun or exciting video and it's kind of been all over the place. That's, that's life sometimes. Mental illness is kind of a serious topic when it comes to stigmatization. And I feel like sometimes you need to have a serious conversation. If you really want to check out a good documentary on people with bipolar disorder, I watched uh, Of Two Minds like so many times when I first saw it years and years ago. I related to every person in that documentary. Thanks for watching and um, I'll see you next time.